Good morning, Memorial Road. Hope everyone's doing well. I start a new series this week. We've, we've been doing Fearless for quite a while. Today we're starting On Purpose. And the idea behind this is it seeks to answer the question that uh, anybody asks when they find themselves in a place they're not supposed to be, which is, what am I really doing here? A few, few weeks ago, I entered the wrong address on my phone, and I was on vacation, and it led me up a mountain into a neighborhood and I was in a rental car that was not meant for the mountain and the snow and so I got very frustrated and I exclaimed why am I here like how did I get to this moment and we all feel that way sometimes where we're like I don't know what I'm doing next and what's my what's my purpose what am I supposed to do with my job what am I supposed to do with my family what am I supposed to do with my friendships like when I get up in the morning like what do I do with these 16 17 hours It's hard to know that. And so I'm starting this series called On Purpose, uh, largely because, well, two reasons. One, over the years in ministry, a lot of people ask this question. I ask this question sometimes. What am I really supposed to be doing with my life? And the second reason that we're doing this series is the book of Ephesians is actually maybe the best book of the Bible to talk about this question because the book of Ephesians uh, does two things. One, it, it says a lot about like big picture, what is God really doing? There's a lot about the, the, the larger cosmic purposes of God in this book. And then secondly, there's a lot of text in this book about the lower picture like us. What are we, what are we supposed to be doing in light of this bigger story? So each week we're going to take a different section of the book of Ephesians and, and talk about it. So I'm really excited about this series. If you don't really know what to be reading in your daily Bible reading, you might pick up the book of Ephesians and start uh, reading some of these passages. Now, I will say, in the middle of this series, two or three weeks away, we are going to have a really special event. We announced it last week. We're, we're calling it Beyond the Building Sunday, and we're going to go back to the parking lot uh, for one day of, of worship. And so there a few more details that I want to give you today about that. June 6th, it is 845 worship for every one worship, 845. Bible class is going to be at 10. We are going to attempt to take a group picture of our church family. Now, you don't really need to worry about looking amazing because you probably won't be able to see yourself when the picture comes out. You'll be a dot. Uh, But we are going to try to do that. Those are fun to look at. In fact, we're also going to try to uh, all be wearing, as much of us that can, our newest edition of a Memorial Road t-shirt. It has been several years since we have put one out to the whole church family. And so watch for an email this week about a new MRCC-designed t-shirt that we're hoping everybody can purchase before June 6th. So mark that on your calendars. We we sure hope that you could be there for that. I'll also say next week, a week from today, I'm taking a break from preaching for a week. And so one of my friends, Dwayne Case, who is the preacher at the Northeast uh, Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, uh, he's going to be delivering the message next week, and I'm super excited that he'll be here, and I think you'll be really blessed to hear this second message on this Ephesians series from Dwayne next week. So here's what I'd like you to do as we get started. I want to give you like 15 seconds, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor something you take for granted. What is something you take for granted? Ready, set, go. Okay, hopefully you were able to share something. I will share with you that one thing I have recently taken for granted is the ability to enjoy food. I, about three weeks ago, got a little stomach ache and I figured it would go away after a day or so. It did not. And one of the symptoms of this little stomach bug was I lost my appetite pretty significantly. And so day after day, didn't want to eat. Food sounded awful. I had a a four-day stretch where I was eating uh, one meal a day. It consisted of a little bit of rice, a little bit of fish, and a lot of Gatorade. And if you do that several days in a row, you start to get really irritable. And that was me. I was I was uh, (laughs) I was not happy. And Part of the reason I wasn't happy is I kept watching other people eat food that I knew I liked, but my brain was just not enjoying. 
And I reached a low moment when Amy Roberts, wife of our young adults minister, Daniel Roberts, she has uh, legendary cinnamon rolls, and she had sent some over to my house to just to be kind to us as we were grieving the passing of my grandmother. So that shows up, and I look at this, and I just get so sad because I love cinnamon rolls, and I think, great, just one more thing that I can't enjoy. And then I took a bite, and I I know it's going to sound like an overstatement. I want to say it was a spiritual moment, although I don't want to like, I don't want to be sacrilegious, but it, it, I, I, I will never forget this moment. It's like something clicked in my brain and my body just said, oh, it's food. I, I was so happy. I, it was just, I was so full of delight. I actually just took the whole thing. I got a fork and I just started shoveling. I mean, I'm sure it was horrible for my intestines, but I was just, I just kept shoveling more and more of the cinnamon roll because it was the first time in a long time that I actually enjoyed food. Turned out it it was just a a virus that just lasted about nine days, and finally I came out of it. And, And even since then, in the last few weeks, what I have found myself is, what I have found myself doing is, I, I am a lot more grateful for the taste of food. When, when something is taken away, uh, you, you tend to be thankful for it. Now, I say all this to introduce this idea. I, I think there's generally two ways to approach a day or to approach a week. One way to approach a day is what I would call top-down complaint. And what this means is that everybody has a ceiling in your life or, or, or something that you don't have. So you, and everybody has this. It's, you know, if I just had a few more thousand dollars tacked on to my salary, or if I, if I just had a few less inches on, on the waistline, or there's that person at work, and if they could just see things the way that I see them, then my life would be better. These, these, if, if the educators and the administrators and the people at my school or my kids' school, if they could just see things the way that I do, then my life would be better. And so we, we think about the top, like the one thing we don't have or the one thing we haven't accomplished, and then we evaluate the rest of our life based on that gap. Well, I don't quite have this. I don't quite have that. And so then what we do is we end up just complaining about the one or two things that we don't have. I just wish I could catch a break. I just, I just wish I wasn't so busy. I just wish I could finally meet someone. And, and we evaluate our whole life based on this little gap between where we are and where we want to be. That's called top-down complaint. A totally different framework for, for embracing a day would be ground-up gratitude. Now, when I say ground-up, I don't mean like you're pushing meat together in your hands, making a hamburger. I mean like you're starting from scratch. You're starting from neutral and building up. What would I actually be thankful for? So imagine this scenario where maybe you go into a coma for five years and then you wake up, but you're healthy. Your your life is generally the same. As you re-embrace life, if you had been in a coma for five years, do you think you'd be focusing more on what you lack or, or what you have? You'd be floored by what you have. You'd take a breath. I have the ability to breathe. You you would open your eyes. I have the ability to see. You would realize that there's people in your life that know your name. And moment by moment, you would just be caught in the wonder of what it means to be alive. That is ground up gratitude. I, two days ago, had lunch with Mitch Wilburn, preacher at the Park Church of Christ in Tulsa. And we, we talked a lot about what's going on in our families, what's going on in our personal life, what's going on with our churches. And, and it, was a, it was a great lunch, and we talked about a lot of good things. We talked a lot about a lot of hard things. Well, if you know Mitch's story, just a few months ago, Mitch nearly lost his life due to COVID. And there was one particular moment where we were talking about the, some of the challenges of church work. And, and one particular challenge being like, because of the pandemic, we're not exactly even sure who goes to our churches anymore. Like, we don't know. It's hard. And there was this moment where he, when there was this pause in the conversation, and he said, but you know, Phil, I'm about to get up from this meal, and I'm going to walk outside, and I'm going to look up, and I'm going to see the sun, and I'm just really, really thankful to be alive. I'm not really worried about all these problems. Well, that's ground up gratitude. Now, you might look at the chart on the screen and think, well, Phil, I think you're just saying half 
empty or half full. Like, you know, just, are, you're just telling us to be optimistic. Well, in a sense, yeah, I guess I'm saying you can think about life as half full or life is half empty, but do you really think that this is the correct ratio that you see on the screen between things you have and things you don't have? No. No, this, this next image is actually a more accurate reflection of life. There is so many more things that you have to be thankful for than you have to complain about, and I'm the same way. <laughs> and the sad reality is many, 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 many of us spend our days complaining about the two things we don't have instead of being thankful for the thousand things that we do. For whatever reason, a lot of us have built this mental habit, and we are now the people that, metaphorically speaking, hike to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and complain about the one mosquito that lands on our arm. Like, don't, don't you want to be someone who can practice ground-up gratitude? So the book of Ephesians begins with a heavy dose of ground-up gratitude. Paul, Paul's first p- paragraph in this book is a paragraph, it's very dense, and he starts talking about all these spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And, and the original readers and us, we, we probably know most of the things that he says. But it's really helpful to pause and just say, do you remember what you actually have? And so I want to read this, or at least part of this paragraph, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And before I even read it, just remember, in, in the same way that I have redeveloped this sense of I I enjoy the taste of my food now. (laughs) As I read this paragraph, again, these are things that a lot of it you already know, but my hope and even my prayer as I've been praying my way into the sermon is I've been praying that you can rediscover and taste the goodness of God. So here's what Paul says at the beginning of Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And here's the first blessing, verse 4. For God chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So the first blessing I want to point out is this. God chose you. And God chose me. I, for years, I've on and off played 6 a.m. basketball used to be at Oklahoma Christian. Now it's played at other places. I I started playing as a kid when my dad would take me, and then I played quite a bit as an adult. Haven't played in quite a while, but it's it's a really, if you can get up that early, it's, it's super fun. Do you know how they pick teams? The two or three best players at the very beginning go off by themselves, and they pick all the teams, and then they come back to the group, and they announce, here's who will be playing on what team. Now, do you know why the best players go off and do this by themselves. They do it for the self-esteem of the worst players. (laughs) Because no one wants to be the person that's picked last. And so they come back and they announce it. Now when I think about this text that God chose us, I tend to read this modern definition of the word choose back on what Paul is writing. And so I think, okay, well, if God is choosing people in the same way that we choose teams today, then that would also mean that there are certain people God is not choosing. And if there are certain people that God is predestining to be part of his family, then that would also mean that there are certain people that are not predestined to be part of his family. And that creates problems. Like if that definition of the word choose is the right definition to read into this, into this text, then what that means is like, what? What's the point of like trying hard in life? What's the point of really trying to make good moral decisions and make the right kinds of choices in life? If God's already decided, then it doesn't really matter. Well, I don't think 
that this modern definition of the word choose is the best, wor- the best way to read this text. Let me give you a totally different framework that has more to do with historical background than this 6 a.m. basketball. We know a lot about Ephesus historically. It's this really big uh, international city, lots, lots of different people. It's a center of trade route, really big city. Uh, they, one of the things that was really big there was the worship of the god Artemis. So you read about in the book of Acts, there's some big riots. Like people are very passionate about worshiping this god or goddess. And she's the goddess of fertility. Now one of the interesting things about Ephesus back in the day is twice a year they would have really, really big festivals. One of these festivals more or less was a matchmaking festival. And so you have people come in and there was absolutely no sexual ethics in this festival. Like we think things are really bad today and they are in some ways. Well, they were pretty bad back then as well. Now one commentator made made this point where, where, where he asked the question, what would this do to the population of Ephesus over time? One of the things that would happen is there'd be a lot of unwanted pregnancies. Now some of these babies would be born and and discarded, as was the practice back then. But some of these babies would be born, and they would not be discarded, but they would grow up as orphans. And and there wouldn't be a lot of kind, gracious, loving families take them in. And so this commentator was saying that the population of orphans in Ephesus would have been really high. So I want you to imagine for a moment the storyline of a girl walking around the city of Ephesus with no past, no history, no future, no identity, When she thinks about herself, she simply thinks, I'm leftovers. I'm the unwanted byproduct of of a fleeting moment of passion, and I have no home. I have no identity. I have no family. And then maybe imagine this girl wandering into this group of people who claim to follow Jesus, and someone pulls this letter out from the Apostle Paul, and she hears these words. You have been chosen by God before the creation of the world to be set apart. And you were destined to be part of his family. Can you imagine how a little girl would hear those words? That's how Paul meant this paragraph to be received. See here, let me summarize it this way. Predestination, it's a big word. It's sometimes a hard word to understand. It it is not an Excel spreadsheet for judgment day. Predestination is an encouragement to believers. <laughs> Paul wants believers to know that, hey, like, y- you have an identity. Like, y- you've been chosen by God. And this can also be an encouragement to us because I, I know you have days. Because I have days where you wake up and you think, what am I doing here? Like, like why? Like, wh- what, is, what is my point about being alive in this, in this world? And you crave to have this identity and this and this job, and this role, and and Paul is coming around, he's saying, guys, girls, ladies, you have a purpose. You have a family. You have an identity. You have been chosen by God himself. And and, and later in the series, we'll talk more about this, but but Paul in this letter does talk about, like, God has this, this, this cosmic project going on to put the whole universe back together. Like, it's broken, it's distorted, it's, it's messed up. And so God slowly, faithfully is in this amazing project of putting it back together and bringing healing to the world and justice to the world and salvation to the world. And God has said, you get to be part of that project. And not because God begrudgingly let you in on it. This paragraph says he wants you. Like it was his will, it was his good pleasure to invite you to be part of this plan. And so even though you might not exactly know your role in your work or your role on your team or your role in school or maybe even your role in your friends or in your family, God is saying, you've got a job. You've got an assignment in my plan. You have an identity. I've I've chosen you. So as we practice ground-up gratitude, we're going to be thankful for the things that we take for granted. The first thing that I want you and and me to understand is simply this, I have been chosen. Let's say it all together. I have been chosen. Say it one more time. I have been chosen. Here's the next 
thing that Paul would want to say to us. Verse 7. In him, as in in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Here's the second thing we're going to practice as, as this week as we try to practice ground up gratitude. First one is I have been chosen. Second one is I have been forgiven. I want you to say this one with me. I have been forgiven. One more time. I have been forgiven. 20 years ago, there was uh, one of the, the most uh, biggest stories of corporate corruption that there's ever been. And if you're old enough, you'll remember this. If, if, you, if you're young, this might be the first time you've heard about this. Do you guys remember the story of Enron? It's a huge, huge scandal. So it's this big energy company, and for years they had hid billions of dollars of debt through various accounting loopholes. Just years of fraud. Well, finally there was an investigation. They were being audited, and, and this was all coming to light, that this is, this is not going to go good for Enron. And they tried qu- quite a few things to cover it up but it wasn't working. And so their final last-ditch effort to try to get rid of all all, all this corruption that that they had done in the past was they had this three-day period where they tried to shed millions and millions of documents, which if they didn't shred shred this paper, it would definitely indict them as far as all the things they had done. And so all these execs started meeting, and they just started shredding all this paper. Well, one of the big problems was (laughs) when they shredded most of these documents, instead of shredding them uh, vertically, they shredded them horizontally. And so, like, a lot of these lines of text were just still there. And so, I mean, it took a lot of people and a lot of computer programs in about three months, but eventually they put together 33 million documents back together. And these documents told the story of every single action of fraud that this company had committed. You see, it's really hard to escape the past. And that's also true when it comes to us. Like, it, it's hard to escape our past. The, the technical biblical definition of sin is to miss the mark, which is very true. But it's also true that the effect of sin is that sin leaves a mark. It leaves a mark on our memories. It leaves a mark on people that we hurt. And so for a lot of us, there's not a day that goes by that we don't live in the past. We remember these sins. Like some of you, not a day goes by and you don't think about that decision that you made that deeply wounded that person that you love. Or you think about the sin of greed And maybe it's not just in the past, maybe it's in the present, but for years you have hoarded the resources that God has blessed you with and you have not given back. And it just kind of eats away at you. Uh, For some of you, there was some sexual sin, either past or present, that you committed and it just, you, you just can't stop thinking about it. Uh, For others of you, it's a sin of injustice where you you did something to someone else or you withheld something from somebody else and you permanently ruined somebody's life and it's just there and you don't know what to do with it. Well, Paul is writing this paragraph for you and for me. Sin is really heavy. But you got to think that when Paul's writing to the Ephesians, there's a lot of sinners reading that first letter. There's a lot of people that have done a lot of things that, that they shouldn't have done. And what Paul is saying, I mean, he, this is the very beginning of the letter. I, I love that he starts with this. In other words, I, I almost get the sense that, that, that one of the things Paul is saying is he's saying, guys, if you, if you live your life as a top-down complainer and you're always looking for things that are wrong, like just things to complain about, he, he almost wants to say, say, just like, would you just stop and pause? And realize that all the things that you have done against the will of God, they've been forgiven. Like Jesus wants to forgive you of these sins. In fact, Paul uses this word lavish. He's lavished this upon us. Sometimes we we have this perception of God that he 
he only doles out this forgiveness on a limited basis if we deserve it or if he's feeling in a particularly good mood. And Paul's saying, no, you don't understand the love of the Father. He's, he's lavished this upon us because he wants to. He wants to be a forgiving God. I have a, a friend who's a small business owner, and this past year was really hard on him. Early in about March, April 2020, the, the building owner where he does his business actually called him and said, hey, I know that we're in lockdown right now, and so I just want you to know that, that during this lockdown, you're not gonna, I'm not going to charge rent because the building's not even open. And my friend was so thankful that the, the, the building owner would say this, and just, it was such a relief. Well, November 2020 rolls around, and there's an accountant that calls him and says, your, your rent is due for these months. It's $9,000. And my friend says, whoa, 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 this, I don't, the owner said I didn't have to pay this. And the accountant says, well, do you have, can you document that? And my friend says, no, I, I he, but he called me. I, I know he said this. And, and the accountant said, no, you, you have to pay this $9,000. And so my friend gets off the phone, looks through his email, can't find any paperwork, tries to call the, the owner, he's not answering. And, and so he calls the lady back and he's just like, I, is there anything you can do? I, I don't have the money. And she says, no, there's, there's, you, you, have, you have to pay this. He's like, can I get it deferred? No, you, you can't get it deferred. We need this money. It's like, you can imagine like how stressed out my friend is. So a month goes by and he, he just, he doesn't know what he's going to do. Well, finally the owner calls him again and says, I'm so sorry. There was a huge mistake. The accountant got it wrong. You don't have to pay that $9,000. And so you can probably imagine just this immense relief that my friend felt when he finally got the news that no, he doesn't have to pay this. And it's not just that he has to pay it a year later or two years later. Like, he doesn't have to pay it at all. Like, there was so much relief. Well, the word forgiveness actually originates in the financial world. It, it's a word that means, it, it originally meant when you owe somebody some money and then that person comes in and says, no, you really don't have to pay this. Like, it, it would mean that the debt was for, forgiven. Now, maybe it wasn't $9,000 in your life, but surely in the last few months, last year, you do know the feeling of when you think you're going to pay for something, and then all of a sudden you don't have to pay for it. It's a pretty good feeling. A month ago, I was driving to Norman, and I I tend to be like a spontaneous shopper. I don't really plan for it. And I'm just driving by on the highway, and I look over and see Kohl's. I'm like, you know what? I haven't bought a belt in like 14 years. I think I'm going to buy a belt. And so I, I uh, stop, and I, I don't even know how much belts cost anymore. I just, I have a belt, and I use it, and it's about to fall apart. Well, I grab a belt off the rack, and uh, another thing I like to do in shopping is I try to get in and out of the store in like four minutes. I'm just, don't, don't like to be in store. So I grab a belt, look at the price tag. I'm like, that's ah, 30 bucks. I didn't know belts were $30. Well, oh well, I'll buy it anyway. So go up to the register, and, and Kohl's always does this. I should have expected this. Rings the belt up. It's not $30. It's $25. And I got to tell you, kind of like the cinnamon rolls at the beginning of the sermon, I was beside myself. Like, I was like looking for someone to high five. Like, I was just so excited. Like, I, I got to save five bucks. Walk out into the parking lot like I've won the lottery. I'm just like, yeah, it's going to be a good day. Isn't it amazing how I got more excited about a $5 discount than the lifetime elimination of my sins? Like, can I get an Amen. <laughs> Like this is like, we, we've, we've got to really set with this. Can you just pause for a moment and just let the weight sink in? You have been forgiven. Like this is a central truth of the Christian faith. In fact, let me read you one more verse. Romans chapter 8. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Like, we just need to pause and be grateful for this. Like, I I know that some of you, you're going to have a hard week, and you don't like the number of hours that you have to work this week, or you don't like the way that your flowers are growing or not growing in your front yard, or maybe you're having a bad hair day, and you're not really happy about that, or or maybe you have some new ache or pain in your body today that wasn't there yesterday, or, or maybe students, you have homework to do today that you don't really want to do. But please just pause and remember, your sins have been forgiven. In fact, I, I just want you to say that with me one more time. Say, my sins have been forgiven. 
my sins have been forgiven. Final thing I'll say is this. The series is about finding your purpose. I want to give you one idea about your purpose this week. Ephesians 5.1 says this, follow God's example. So what did we learn today that God does? Well, we learned two things. Number one, God chooses forgotten people. And number two, God forgives sinful people. So you might have a lot of things that you're planning on doing this week, but if you want to rediscover your purpose this week, I would recommend that number one, you ask the question, who is forgotten in my world? And if you want to be like God, you're going to go find that person. Because that's what God does. He chooses forgotten people. And the second question I'd ask you to ask yourself this week is, who do I need to forgive? You are never more like God than when you forgive. If you'll pray with me. Father, you have chosen us to be in your family and to carry out your mission. And we praise you for that. And Father, you have forgiven us of our sins. Not because we're all that great or because we're all that smart or because we get it right all the time. You chose to forgive us because you wanted to. And we praise you for being a forgiving and gracious God. And we pray, Father, that we can be the kind of people who look for the forgotten and reach out to them to love them. And we pray that we can be the kind of people that when others harm us and offend us and make us angry, would you help us to be the kind of people that can choose to forgive? In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and everybody said, amen.